members of Uh, yeah, so I'm Suzanne Hodge. I work at Lancaster University. I'm a qualitative researcher, supervise lots of trainee <coughs> clinical psychologists. That's Thank you. I'm Kirsty. Hi, I'm Kirsty Coxon. I'm a um, at UCLan. I'm an assist team at UCLan, the REACH team in the Brian mm -hmm. Centre, and um, I'm also a qualitative researcher working in maternity care. Uh, I work a lot with narrative methods, but general broad based qualitative methods. <laughs> And the other member of our team, Lorna uh, from Edgehill, is it Edgehill? Uh, JMU. JMU, John Morse, yeah, <laughs> is not able to be here. So um, she's the other, the other part of our quadrumate, whatever four <laughs> people are called together. <laughs> so uh, I don't know if you could put on, um, Mandy, just the the, the um, website from Midas itself, so we can just give a, have a quick introduction of that to people, because I just want to explain where we fit. So for those who don't know, as some you know, of you online or in the room will know, but those who don't know, uh, the ARC, um, the ARCs around the country have set up various support systems for, um, can we go back to it again? Oh, sorry, just, just trying to yeah. yeah, okay. Yes, yeah, just to make sure you can see it online, everybody. You need me to direct you to the sharing box. Not be here, where is that? I'm in share. You're in share. Are you not all seeing the um the online version, everybody? No. We had problems with yesterday actually, <laughs> getting it in both places. I mean, you, you, we got really used to online meetings, didn't we? You would imagine we're getting used to hybrid meetings, but it doesn't seem like that looks like that. Sure. Yeah. Can you see that right? online now? Can anybody not see the online version? Shout. No shouting. Good. Okay. I can't see it, sorry, I'm shouting. <laughs> is that just one person who can't see it or um, is everybody not having a problem with it? Yeah, I, I can't see yeah. it either. No, I can't see it. Oh, yes, I sorry, it no, now. I can, yeah. Yeah, no, cool. Yeah. Okay, so can I just have a little um, go with the mouse? Yeah. yeah. So, so the ARCs around the country have all set up a whole range of different support for uh, research in health and social care. And what we have specifically in the Northwest is these Midas, um, Midas network of subgroups that are working in various areas. And you can see ours is here, qualitative, but there are a whole range of different methodological support groups going down here. And there are links across to these various uh, other aspects that are kind of associated with um, the work that we're doing at UCLan. Sorry, I'll go back to that again. And um, in association with, our, with the ARCs. So now see, now I can't get back to it again, which is very helpful, isn't it? Oh, my God. So if you look on the website, these are the range of teams that are associated. Uh, these are the range of people that are associated with the Midas group. And there's more information on various aspects of the Midas um, activities here. So anybody can kind of link into that. So, you know, these are these are a range of things that are covered under the Midas umbrella and under the ARC. So lots of information and, and resources there if people want them. So sorry, Matt, if we go back to the um the people. Oh, I'm just going here, shall I? There we are. Yeah. So hopefully everybody's got the program for today. Um we have actually got 10 minutes. If there's any, if we can quickly maybe go around and just have 10 seconds each. So your name and where you come from and your discipline. So I'm Joanna Harrison. I'm a research fellow in evidence synthesis and summary in the Midas team. Hi, I'm Corsa Khan. I'm from Lancaster University. I'm one of the ARC researchers and I'm in the Equitable Place space in the ARC Can I just check? Can you all hear what's being said in the room? What do people need to project a bit more? Yeah, that's okay. Fine. Yeah. I'm Kathleen and I'm part of the researcher so I am interested in the qualitative aspects of research as well so I am a member of this group as well. Great. I'm Becky, I'm just outside visiting today, I'm a midwife from Manchester. Hi Becky. I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm in a pre-doctoral fellowship so interested in clinical academics. Kirsty, you're great from? Kath? I'm Kath Harris, uh, I'm an information specialist with the MyDesk team. I'm Martha Bailen, I'm um, a terms of research at UCLA. Okay, and we've heard from Suzanne and we've heard from us too, so that's fine. 
So let's go to online. So I'm going to do the usual thing of trying to, trying to make sure that I don't miss people by going down the list of people I can see. So I'm going to start with Karen Higginbottom. Uh, yeah, I'm Karen. I'm a senior lecturer um, at Liverpool John Moores in the Faculty of Health. Uh, my areas of research interest are in advanced care planning, end of life and heart failure. That's great. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Great. Thanks. Uh, Catherine Abba. Catherine. Hello, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Yes, I'm here. Excellent. The camera doesn't work. I'm sorry. I don't know why. That's fine. Tell us who you are and where you're from. Oh, sorry, Catherine Abba, um, the University of Liverpool. I'm working on um, the Ways to Wellbeing study, which is an evaluation of a social prescribing program where people can be referred to get advice from citizens advice. Great. Alex Barnes. Yeah, morning. I'm um, Alex. I'm business and law faculty at uh, Liverpool John Moore's PhD researcher, qualitative methodology in a psychology uh, discipline. Great. Uh, Jamie Hunter. Hi, I'm Jamie. I'm, I'm a NIHR public advisor and I'm usually based in Southport. Thank you, Jamie. Uh, Hayley, like the pain? There's two Hayley. Uh, hi, I'm Hayley. I'm a PhD student based at Lancaster, but also a researcher based at UCLan. Um, and my PhD is looking at inequalities in mental health services. And I'm just about to do my third study, which is a qualitative study. So that's why I'm interested in turning it today. Brilliant. Claire Maxwell. Yeah, I'm a senior lecturer in midwifery at Liverpool, John Moores University, and my research interests are in maternal and infant health. Fantastic. Uh, Abigail Morris. Hello, yeah, I'm a lecturer at Lancaster University um, and I work in the Centre for Organisational Health and Wellbeing. So my interests around kind of process evaluation and evaluating workplace interventions. OK, oh, you've all jumped around. I might miss people now. So, so is it um, Omar Balane or Ola Binju? Sorry, I don't know which way around your, your names go. Apologies. <laughs> no, it's fine. Yeah, my name is Omar Balanle Ola Gunju, and I'm a project support officer at the Innovation Agency. Thank you. Uh, Paul Brain. Paul, you there? I might come back to you, Paul, if you're not joining on. Rebecca Selby. Yep, hi, um, I'm Becca Selby and I'm a doctoral fellow at the ARC um, and I'm based at UCLan and I'm looking at parent and carer perceptions of infant feeding health messages. Sally Wright. Hello, I'm um, Sally Wright. I am a senior lecturer in clinical pharmacy at John Moores University. Okay. Uh, James, have we done James? James, we talked to you already, haven't we? I think. Ying Chi. Hello. Uh, Hi. <laughs> you can call me Heidi. Um, I'm a first year PhD student from Edge Hill, and my topic is um, I would like to explore Taiwanese adolescents who receive art psychotherapy, their experiences. Thanks. Fantastic. And Hortense. Hortense Young. Sorry about that. Good morning. My name is Hortense Young. I am a P PhD student at John Moore's University and um, my discipline is in psychology. I'll be looking at an intergenerational family perspective on supporting offenders with intellectual and developmental disabilities. Thank you. Have I missed anybody out? Put your hands up if so. Great, OK, so well, that's fine. So we've, we've actually done that in record time. And I think part of the, the what that's illustrated is the range of people and disciplines and backgrounds that have come together here, but all obviously within the context of this idea of qualitative research. So hopefully this morning session is going to raise some questions, provide some evidence, give some learning to people, 
it's a shame that we can't be all face to face for the afternoon session because I imagine we, we could develop some really interesting projects together. But understandably, not least with the train strikes, it's not been straightforward. So with our small but perfectly formed group here, we will uh, we will do some work this afternoon and hopefully feed that back to the, the overall group. And maybe if some interesting projects arise, then there may be some things that you online might want to link with us um, in the room with later. So I'm going to hand over to Marie Claire at this point, and um, you've got a bit longer now, Marie Claire, than you thought you had. Hooray! <laughs> <laughs> so Marie Claire is senior research assistant at UCLan in, in our team. Uh, she has a background in history and socio-cultural stuff. <laughs> 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 but her main interest is migrant women, yes. isn't it? migrant refugee women um, in the kind of maternity period and ways of uh, engaging with them. So, yes, over to you. Yeah. <laughs> Brilliant. So yeah. So hello. So my um, my partner in crime is unfortunately not here at the moment. So I'm doing this work with um, Carol Hunt, who unfortunately can't be here. So I will be explaining some of the, uh, her aspects as well. And Kath Harris has also been involved in the project. So um, what I want to do today is, is explain a bit about the evolution of the project and the kind of methods methodology we're trying to develop. So. Um, we call this thinking through things, sharing stories of mothers and motherhood told through everyday objects and belongings. Um, yeah, so it's to talk about how the project developed because it's a interdisciplinary project bringing people together who've not worked together before in quite new ways, um, hopefully. And um, so I'll just say a little bit about the people in the project, where we're up to the research so far, a bit about the rationale and the aims, methodology, what we're trying to do and where we're feeling our way, the pilot study, and then the next steps, um, and then time for some questions and discussion, which I think will be really helpful for us because we are just, it's evolving gradually. Um, so there's been part of a wider a project, which is maternal objects in transition, um, using material culture to explore asylum seeking and refugee women's experience of maternity care and the transition to motherhood in the UK. So it's a, um, a wider project that brings in interest in migration, migration studies, maternal health, and then increasingly trying to think of different ways of engaging with, with women using um, material culture, and in this case, specifically everyday objects rather than other aspects of material culture. Um, and the larger team, myself, Carol, and so, uh, myself, yeah. Carol and Kath at UPlan, and then we working with um, colleagues at Bradford, Dr Mel Cooper, Pip Knight, who's at the University of Birmingham, but also used to work with Refugee Women Connect, and then um, colleagues Jane Lippett and Lana, um, who are, are part of the East Meets West group, which is um, a women's I'll say a little bit more a women's group in Lancaster who work with asylum seeking refugee women um, and families. And Refugee Women Connect. So we're working with um, we're working with a couple of groups in partnership to develop this idea, um, to see if it's appropriate, if they like it, if it's acceptable, you know, to, to the women we're working with rather than us, because we think it's a great idea, um, but obviously other people might not be quite as happy with it. Um, so my background, so I work within uh, maternal health, I work with Sue in REACH. Um, but my background is history, women's studies, kind of all history, quality, very, very qualitative, um, kind of no numbers. <laughs> um, a bit of work around visual and documentary work, but primarily um, kind of all history type methods. Um, and so for the last 10 years, maybe 13 years, um, I've been working in, in maternal health. So I'm not a clinical practitioner, so my work is around the sociocultural, political, aspects of maternal care, health care um, for marginalised women, women who've been marginalised for various different reasons. And then most recently my work is with asylum seeking refugee women um, within that. 
and then my partner in crime who can't be here, Carol Hunt, is in textiles and fashion. So she's a visual artist working in textiles and fashion. Uh, her interests are a lot around the kind of social history of women, um, medicine, um, that kind of medical humanities thing, but coming at it through visual art and through textiles and uh, fashion. So she's done work um, with um, at Bedlam through working with uh, strong, strong clothes. Uh, she's done work with the Foundling Museum with, uh, with the tokens. And this was a big project she did with another colleague from UCLan, um, look, using textiles to look at migration and ideas of home and belonging. It's working with Gawthorpe Hall. Um, and so it's been a huge project, but again, foregrounding textiles as a way of, of opening things up, allowing people to talk about home and belonging. So she's coming in from um, not from a maternal health background, but from this kind of technical background, not worked in health before, and I've also not worked in textiles and material culture before, so it's a, an interesting coming together. And so what we've been doing so far... Um, yeah. Okay. Um, so it's been funded by Mydex, Seafood Grove, Life, Cipra, and a bit of Thrive money, so we've all been working together. We've been pre presenting in various different locations, which has been interesting. The CEPA work was presenting at a visual, visual culture seminar, which was interesting. Um, and then we've been presenting at migration, um, migration events as well. Um, so the rationale is, obviously women's experience, not all women experience motherhood, but for women who do experience motherhood, that transition to motherhood and the care they receive at that point, at that liminal point in their lives, is really important and has huge significance and lifelong um, impact for, for mothers and babies. So we, we know that. Um, and the research methods at times have really failed to adequately and um, appropriately hear the experiences of asylum-seeking refugee women for various um, reasons. But we're really not hearing those women's stories in a way that's helping us bring about change because we have the evidence years of evidence now that um, science seeking refugee women have a much higher level of morbidity mortality poor experiences we have that knowledge we've had it for such a long time but we're not actually being able to make a difference and we're really not hearing from the women um, about what they need and what will will help make things better you know we know the statistics that black women are four times more likely to die than asian women twice twice as likely, these are much, much higher for newly arrived women, I mean, catastrophically higher. Um, but, but we've not done very much about it. And we, you know, we've known these figures for so long. Um, and I think that lack of understanding you know, has, has really clear physical implications for looking after these women. If we don't know what they need and what they want, and we're not asking the right questions, and we're not hearing them, then, then we're not going to be able to bring about the changes they need. And they're very clear about what they need. If you talk to women about what they want, they're incredibly clear about what they need, but we're not hearing in, a, in an appropriate way. So as part of thinking, you know, you know, what, how can we do this better? What can we do? My PhD research is a much more traditional. I've interviewed women, I've done focus groups, and it's fine. I've got good results or useful results, but it's not really the best way, I don't think it is. So, um, not that if my super, any supervisors or any examiners are listening, it's fabulous. <laughs> but, um, you know, as part of a, of a wider thinking. So what we're trying to do, the whole project is to investigate creative methodology, which would explore the experience of science in the transition using material culture. So going about it at a different, different way, rather than traditional, um, interviews and focus groups and traditional interviews are a real issue and, and having done them you know there's an awareness that the women that we work with have been interviewed multiple times and disbelief so they're operating in a culture of disbelief they've been interviewed by the home office multiple times various other people um, interviewing them in a way to try and disprove what they're saying so I'm very nice but why would they trust me. Why should they tell me anything? It just feels really not not a helpful way. You can build trust. You can work with women. You can assure them that the Home Office won't know anything. 
but it, it's not the right way. It really doesn't feel, and the power dynamics are still really weird. So I just think there are better ways, and this is what we're trying to do. Um, oh, and I have to say, the beautiful images you'll see uh, come from the pilot workshop. A lot of them come from the pilot workshop, where we worked with a professional photographer to take pictures of the images um, take pictures of the objects that women brought in. So I'll say more about that, but that's why the pictures are so beautiful. And the slides are so beautiful because Carol did them. She's a visual artist. You see how much better than normal ones. Um, so this is what we're trying to do. Um, so so what, what are we doing? What are the key elements we're trying to do? And when we thought about what it is, we, what is it we're trying to do? How do these bits fit together? And we thought, well, it's about people. It's about things, it's about the actual objects, the physicality of the objects, it's about storytelling, and it's about moving towards a more inclusive way of, of, of working with women to find out their stories. This is a picture of me as well, I'm at. So, um, so the people we worked with, so we work closely with um, East Meets West, who are, um, uh, women's group set up, uh, set up quite a while ago, it's a, a, a multi-faith women's group, that after about 2015, their focus became um, working with asylum seekers and refugees who come to Lancaster, because we have quite a few refugees come to Lancaster, it's been quite a welcoming place. Um, and they hold regular uh, drop-ins for women, they have, cook lunch together, they do educational things, they do cultural things. And so we've been working with them as partners to say, this is the research we're interested in doing. Are you interested? Do you think it's okay? How do we need to do it? How can we approach you? Because it's a group of women of multi-faiths, uh, women who are from Lancaster and women who are newly arrived in various different ways. So we've been working with them and they've hosted the pilot events we've done and given us feedback on, on the acceptability and how it's going. And they're brilliant, they're really interesting women. So this is Carol's book. So, oh, it's cut off the picture. This is a picture of a beautiful um, little baby's jacket. So when we're looking at things, so material culture is obviously this really enormous, huge area. But material culture is everything that has been produced by a human that's not natural. So it encompasses film, all sorts of, of things. But what we're really looking at is everyday objects or kind of mon what we call mundane objects. And we're interested in them, not in terms of um, their, we're interested in materiality, but not in the detailed materiality. So there's work been done that's about looking at the nature of the textiles, whether they're tactile, um, there's work done at what the things are worth, their value, their usefulness. And there's been lots of about consumption and, and conspicuous consumption. And we're kind of not looking at that, although those are interesting things. What we're looking at is using things as um, an emotional touchstone or as a kind of something that holds this phrase, sticky emotions. They're amazing. They're, and we're using them um, and looking at, as, as Turkle says, their role in the trauma as a tra in transitions, that they're a marker of relational change, of emotional change, of things that are happening. So we're using them in that sense because there's a lot of other work about using things in different ways in a um, within material culture. There's, there's ways, we've read papers where it's about um, stuff that's with newborn babies, about how fluffy it is and how soft it is, and that's somehow analogous, but we're kind of not using them in that way in this project. We're using them as, as a touchstone. And what we did, um, which I'll talk about a little bit later, is we asked women to bring in an object that was important to them in their transition to motherhood. Um, because we were aware some women wouldn't have those because they're refugee and asylum seeking women, we also said oh, it could be a picture of that object or it could be a memory of that object. Um, and then we expanded it again because we were aware that some of the women in the room maybe may have had children, so we could say if it was an object that linked you to your mother. But it's so we tried to be as inclusive as we can. In the end, we thought most of the women would be it's a mother and baby group largely, so they do come. Um, but we didn't suggest anything. We just said it's an it's it's generated by them. Whatever meant something for you, you could bring. And um, so we said that to Kath as well. And I brought something. And so we all it was it's it's generated from the person rather than me saying, oh, isn't it lovely about a lovely knitted shawl or a lovely knitted. So it's but 
we were really aware or became aware that actually there's quite a lot of emotional labour to be done. That, that involves a lot of emotional labour and that's something we're really cognizant of in that we're asking women to go away and think about what means something in that context. And for many of these women, that context is a really challenging context. Mm -hmm. So to say to some, go away and you know, think about what means something to you in that context is actually really difficult. And so there is some work around um, ensuring the safety aspect of that and asking and saying to women, we're really aware this could be quite difficult. And so, so that's an interesting area I think that we have to be really aware of. Um, even just like me doing it, I, mean, I was thinking about these little boots and it made me cry and I was thinking that's all fine for me I have no trauma associated with it and Kath I'm sure it was quite emotional for you thinking about what you were going to bring um, so we're using them as a, we're using them as a catalyst to share their experiences of maternity and the transition to motherhood in the UK um, so that kind of looking at Art Franks the wounded storyteller I'm losing my words so that idea of storytelling because this seems um, a more appropriate, more helpful way in which we can interact with women. They can tell their stories, construct their narratives in the way they want to, using the objects as a touchstone. Um, and that seems to be a way that women saw it as well in that way. And then this is really about us saying what we're trying to do. This isn't beautifully co-produced. This isn't amazingly <coughs> participatory. We haven't resolved all power hierarchies and dynamics. But it's a movement towards that. It's an attempt to move women and women's stories, as Bell Hook said, from the margins to the centre. So they are central to research. Their stories, as defined by them, are central because only when they're central can we really understand them. We're aiming it to be more participatory. We're aiming to kind of try and co-produce knowledge in a way that we're asking What's important to you? Which objects do you want to bring in? Not the ones I think might be useful. And really try and move, move along that continuum towards co-produced knowledge. It's more inclusive. It's less frightening. Um, we did it with women who's, well, all the women in English is their second language, but women who read quite limited English, we could do this with, with some translation help. It felt inclusive and the women who were involved from a range of different settings and in different ways. Um, so before we set, so we thought this is a brilliant idea, we've cracked it, we've got a fabulous idea, it's going to be all great and then we thought oh, no, we should really do, cat comes in, um, and so we thought right we should do a scoping review shouldn't we, we're in well, well taught, well brought up, I need to do a scoping review to see what's out there. So we did, I say we, the royal we, <laughs> Kath did a search for us um, and we, we took a very broad open um, search because we weren't sure where, where things would be so we, we went to visual arts, humanities, um, health to see what was out there, to see what had been done and what we were looking for was had material culture been used to, to explore that transition to motherhood, how had it been used and had it been used, not particularly with asylum seeking women but generally. Um, not so many papers, about nine, nine papers in the end, um, which looked at it in different ways. So there was a lot around um, baby loss and bereavement. So there was a lot of work around objects within that field. So baby boxes, memory making. So there's quite a lot of work around bereavement and bereavement in the sense of women who had their children taken away from them. So there's that aspect. There was quite a lot of work around um, consumption, um, which has kind of been done quite a lot in other areas, that kind of conspicuous consumption and class analysis, which is interesting, but it really has been done and that was something we weren't particularly interested in. But the main things I think that came up from the review, and um, that's going to be written up really soon, um, is that objects play this, this really important role in preparation, mastering, and the memorialising of becoming a mother. So I think it's really interesting that a performative aspect of motherhood and constructing the kind of mother you feel you are, the kind of mother you feel you can be, you should be, the kind of mother you show to other people. So I think it's really interesting, this idea of objects as, as constructing that, and we become mothers by using these objects. So it's a really rich stream, I could see mothering. Um, 
and that yeah, that these are central to the construction of motherhood because motherhood obviously is constructed culturally, socially, historically. So the objects and our consumption of them, our relationship with them, are part of that. But also that material culture did really seem to be a really useful way of exploring it in these quite different settings. Intra getting women to bring in objects or looking at objects did seem to be a, a fruitful way. So then I went to talk to some asylum seeking refugee women in Liverpool to say, look, we've got this great idea. This is what we're planning to do. What do you think? You know, because I think it's great. I didn't say that. I was leave them that much. I said we're doing this. This. And they, yeah, they said, this seems great. This is really, we like it, it's creative. It feels better than you just asking us questions. We're involved, we're creative. Um, they really liked sharing experiences with themselves and with me, because I brought in some objects and they really liked that, because they said it makes, it feels like we're all in it together, because often, and this is the dynamic thing will come up later, there's that othering, we're really othered. We're told we're different, we're a problem, it's challenging. Whereas, yes, but we're also all mums together and we really liked it when you talked about your baby shoes. Um, so there was that was a really nice thing. All the women instantly could think of an object. So I hadn't prepared this. They instantly thought of something. Um, often it was something they didn't have for those women. For one woman, it was her baptismal candles that she couldn't bring when she fled. Um, other women, it was objects they had to leave at home. Um, and other women, it was things that they only had things for their new baby, but they didn't have things for their other babies. But they instantly thought about it. They could go there straight away, and it was a really rich scene of um, kind of discussion. And they were very keen that sharing their experiences might help make things better for other women. They, that was part of their rationale. They were like, this is a nice thing to do, but we can see that it might help. Um, so they were very positive. So then we took a, um, we did a pilot workshop. So this is uh, in Lancaster, we did this. So we sent out, we did all the ethics before we sent this out, obviously, we did all the ethical clearance. And um, we, sent, we took a, sent out a flyer, um, or produced a flyer and information sheet and went to the group to East Meets West. So I went to East Meets West several times. I know that some of the women there quite well and I explained what the project was, explained what they would have to do. Um, you know, we, we had the information sheet translated by our colleague and, you know, said, would you be interested? What do you think? So yes, brilliant. Unfortunately, we timed it on the day there was an English exam. So we still got eight women, but we, we would have had a lot more because a lot were very, very interested. So what we did, is we'd ask people beforehand to say, bring in an object, think about what might mean something to you or that you'd like to share in this context. Um, I don't know, the green thing's coming up at the bottom. Oh, that's disappointing. So what I'll do is, is talk about uh, the workshop, but show you some of the images, which is, I'm really sorry, it's got that green thing. These are really beautiful images. So um, what we did is we, we set up the room to have to be a circle so that women could hopefully share their stories. Then the idea was that then when they talked about their object, they are been taken off and photographed by the professional photographer and then they come back into our room. So it didn't work like that because it never does. So um, we had women coming in late, women who could only stay for a short amount of time, women who needed it to finish quickly so they could have a lunch, babies everywhere. So this is normal for my work, there's always babies. And so, um, so yeah, so we had eight women and what we asked them to do, we were very aware of not what we didn't do is ask them for their life story because we're not doing that we we're very clear we said we're not going to ask you to talk about a specific object what it means to you and why you brought it in please just tell us your name how long you've been here and where you came from do not you do not have to tell us your entire story because we're not in a place to keep those women safe if they disclose their trauma of their journey um, so they're very specific about that. But interestingly, one of the women who is a very confident woman and confident about her story, and actually her story has a happy resolution, she's now become a citizen, launched into telling her whole story from start to finish. Um, she brought an object and it was, she was trying to contextualise the object. So we let her go. And gracious, but what that did, and it's something, was um, that one of the other women felt she had to share that, her whole story as well. 
So at that point, we had to kind of stop and say, you know, we're just asking you to share the details of the particular object and why. So it's interesting to be aware of that. We thought we'd managed it. Um, but, but it's interesting, this woman wanted to tell her, tell her story and she wanted her name to be used. So with ethics, we were not using names, we were taking objects, we were taking pictures of the objects, not of the women, not of their hands. This woman said, no, I want you to use my name. I can use my name, I'm really proud of it. You can use my name, you can take my picture. Why don't I take a picture of me and the teddy? And we're like, oh, no, you can't. So again, that's perhaps another thing to think about in part of the discussion, this ethical. It's an issue. We'd said, oh, no, absolutely not, we can't. And she was like, but why? I mean, so, uh, whereas the, the was woman, there was one particular woman there who we couldn't have done that with. There was a woman who was particularly vulnerable to outside situations, but it was it was interesting. So um, these are some of the objects. So this is we can tell they're beautiful pictures, aren't they? They're just beautifully photographed. So this is one of I'm just going to say a little bit about what people brought and then what the issues that came up around that. Am I right to time? We've got another only ten minutes. So this is um, this is from um, yeah a, a lady I know who um, when her uh, she's Muslim so when uh, the baby's born it has they have their hair, the hair shaved and you save the um, the hair and the weight of the hair you donate the money so so she saved the baby's hair and the umbilical cord now my friend was saying she's going to bring the umbilical cord and I was saying don't you don't know. Jokingly, I mean, obviously bringing what you want, just going, oh, I'm going to be brief, oh, really? mm -hmm. um, but actually the story behind this is this is all she had because she is Palestinian refugee and her family are refugees. So not only is she displaced, mm -hmm. her whole family are displaced. So the stuff her mum had saved for her has gone, the stuff she'd saved has gone, and this is what she has. So this was so important to her, which is really interesting because I was like joking because they're going, oh, yeah. Um, which is fine, because I know it's not unethical. <laughs> but so it was, it was that, that multiple displacement, you know, a kind of evidence of that. The one before, um, this was a lady who was, was in a very, very marginal situation. And this was the first thing she bought for her baby. And it was really important because it was when she found out she was pregnant, she bought this. This was symbolic of her becoming pregnant. Um, and so... Um, these are the shoes I share. These are my boys' little blue shoes. Um, and the other ones, the pink slippers, are a, a, a woman I know a little bit who's had three boys. Um, difficult situation for her boys. They had thalassemia and it was very, very tricky. She turned up with a carrier bag full of pink, fluffy, shiny, everything. And I was like, oh yeah, I forgot. She's your little girl, isn't she? So she had a bag of stuff that was just symbolising this little girl and her pride and joy of having this little girl. Oh no. Okay, that was what's going on. These are um, their po hair pockets. They're the hair that's been saved and put in a, kept in little envelopes. So again, for another another lady who had, wasn't able to save much. Um, this again is the, the lady who's had a little girl and we, we were there photographing for a long time, weren't we, all her things. <laughs> But the kind of things that oh, I'll go into that before, uh, the things that came up were really interesting. They were a mixture of um, that sense of difference and experience of a different cultural experience. So there were women who just said, "How am I going?" My feeling was, "How was I going to be able to cope with nobody here? I'm on my own. I've no mother. I've no auntie." So there was that sense of difference. There was that sense of loss of dislocation so women did speak about their experiences of motherhood in a new country which is like what i thought i would maybe find um but they also spoke about much more universal things that fear of becoming a mother that oh my god I'm, what's happening to my body how am i going to cope am i going to be a good enough mother so it was a really interesting dynamic of the two of that kind of universal concerns about motherhood and transition and then really specific things about I didn't know what was going to happen I had no idea who was going to look after my other children so th so there was a mixture of things um, and then we asked for some feedback um, 
so we have really positive feedback um, that they didn't, you know, um, didn't expect. It was amazing. I didn't expect it emotionally. I expressed my feelings, and I think other women expressed their feelings. And there was that communal, safe sense of women talking to each other about their birth experiences. And they were ranged from um, women with one baby to experienced mothers with much older children. So it was it was a very interesting communal experience. Um, and then I think reflections for us so far that material culture does seem to provide you know, a positive creative way of working with science seeking women. We want to do some more studies. We've only, this was a very small group of women. So we want to try and do um, some more work. Um, can this provide evidence for change? So what I think I went into it thinking, even though I'm saying oh, I went into it three, I wasn't thinking about anything. But obviously my rationale behind my work is to improve the situation for asylum seeking refugee women in maternity care. So in a way, was I looking for evidence for that? And actually, maybe this is partly the place, but as next point, I think there's intrinsic and instrumental benefits. So I think there's instrumentally, we can learn about things. We can learn about, I didn't have an interpreter. I felt particularly alienated or those kind of things. But there is an intrinsic value of being listened to, that kind of feminist hearing, being spoken to, speaking, being heard, being listened, being recognised, that seemed really important to the women, which would tie in with all the other work I would hope to do. Um, I think there is a wider application of this approach. I think it's not just with these women, I think with women generally, with other transitions of life, it'd be really interesting. But I think it does lend itself to women who may feel more marginalised, who may feel um, challenged by a more traditional research approach. It's interesting balancing arts, humanities and healthcare. So me and Carol have this, I'm saying, but how can we think about change? What are we going to do? And she's saying, but it's beautiful in itself. Yes, but so we have this constant um, giving up some control of the process and learning to be flexible researchers. It's just really crucial. I kind of, you have no idea how we turned up on the day. We didn't know how many women had come, how long they'd have, how many kids there'd be, if they bring things, if we had the right translator. You don't know, you just go with the flow. Um, and also, I think it's reinforced the idea of the need for trauma informed research practice. So, one woman who, having seen this other woman share her story, felt she would be expected to share her story, even though we'd expressed that we really weren't expecting that. And she was quite distressed about that. So, it's that awareness, constant awareness, that um, the transition to motherhood can be, you know. Many of these women will have experienced trauma, it could be gender based violence, it could be sexual exploitation on the way. Their births may have been fabulous, they may not have been, and they may have had other births that have been less fabulous. And then finally, this, this last, last um, image is this is one of the women who runs the group, um, and she brought in her muslin cloth that she used for her baby, um, and she said, I thought this image was really important. She said, my husband didn't want me to. My husband wanted me to bring in those beautiful stacking bricks because they're really beautiful that babies played with. She said, I want this in. And I watched it. Um, and she said, it was just this really, she said, her baby has cerebral palsy and um, constant, threw up constantly. And she said, she went to a consultant who went, she was saying, oh, I'm really worried my baby, you know, it's just throwing up all the time. She's really sick. Oh, it's fine. Give, give me the baby. I'll, I'll feed her. And she went, you might want this. No, I won't. We'll be fine. And she, this was her like, and the, uh, her daughter was there, daughter's grown up. And she went, yeah, look at me now, I'm fine, aren't I? <laughs> and it was just this, and, and then she went, oh, no, I washed it because it was stained. Oh, my goodness. So it, it was, this is what she chose as the most important thing. Mm -hmm. So I think that's really interesting that that was it. Not the beautiful bricks, not the, this is what she um, had brought. So I think that's it. So. Thank you very much. Thank Question and are you keeping an eye on the on the people online? So if people online want to put their hands up if they want to um, ask by a question or add a contribution. And while we're just waiting to see if anyone does that, any comments or thoughts from the, the room? Well, Mary Carl, when you're talking, I thought, I thought it's really interesting about um, trying to balance the power relationship mm. and that you brought objects as well. What decisions did you make about how you organised, how you ordered it? You know, did you go first or last, or what? what how, how did you work that out? This, this one I didn't, I didn't show 
I didn't talk about mine. I brought mine in the past to show them. But Kath brought hers. You were in the middle, weren't you? I think we mixed everybody yeah. up. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, we invited Kath to be a part of it. Oh. And Carol was going to share as well. But then we had a bottleneck at the... Uh, talking about being flexible, we had a bottleneck at the pho photographic bit because all the ladies wanted to go and see their objects being photographed. We were going, oh, sit down, we're going to discuss it. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, yeah, we try kind of integrate it. Um, but in the past, I'd taken mine as, a, as an example and to share and to show that kind of, tr yeah, trying to show that this is how it was for me. So, yeah, but we, we integrated Kath as a, as a member of the team. And how was it? Was it all right? Yeah, I think um, I was quite aware of having very different experiences, I suppose, and maybe being careful not to say, not wanting to say anything insensitive, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. but it was, uh, yeah, a good part of it, and like you say, to, yeah, it's good. That's a really good point, isn't it, about, um, about kind of, not group think so much, but but if all the stories been told are negative, do people feel like they need to carry on telling negative stories, or do they think it's okay to have positive stories as well? Mm -hmm. So I suppose the question is, did you get positive stories coming out of the mix as well? Yeah, yeah. yeah. We, we it mainly didn't. What we didn't get was bad stories about maternal care. We didn't get that. We got because I kind of thought maybe that's what we'll get, mm -hmm. but we got stuff about being a mother, mm -hmm. much more about being a mum, about what it felt like when I looked at my baby, mm -hmm. when I was worried that I wouldn't be a good enough mum. Mm -hmm. We got much more of that than I thought maybe I'd get, well, it was an interpreter, it was horrible. Mm -hmm. We didn't get that, actually. Mm -hmm. What we did get was the kind of deeper stuff, actually, about experiences of being a mum. Yeah, got a couple of questions online now, I think. Yeah. Usefully one and two, so I think the end for So I'll turn to John to speak. Yes, thank you very much. Um, when you started, a couple of things came to my mind. Object relation therapy and art therapy. Um, and also nonverbal communication. You spoke about two women. One had shared her story and the other one that um, wasn't allowed to because that wasn't the the forum for expressing oneself. What was the aftercare for that individual? Because even though it was um, a study, I honestly think that those lady went through a therapeutic moment. Mm -hmm. I think they had benefited without you guys knowing that maybe you guys were the first person to actually ask them to bring an object and um, for them to be connected with transitioning to, to motherhood. Yeah, so both ladies told their story, um, but one told an ex her extended story and the other woman, so we let her tell her extended story so she could be heard. And then the other woman, we just said, no, just tell the little bit that's safe to feel. But yeah, we were very careful with um, going through East Meets West. They are um, a group who provide support for, I'm looking at the owl, so it's looking at you. <laughs> um, they're a group who provide support for women. So we consciously worked with East Meets West because if women are distressed at all, that's the place they go to because East Meets West is a very um, supportive group and can signpost women on. And I think what I did find is the women supported each other there was that real sense of um, those eight women held that space and we ensured that um, women had time to speak afterwards we were with them so there was a real awareness of that um, potential re-triggering but also I think I agree that sense of talking about things is really important I think that's what the um, the quote was about as well that sense of women together sharing so it's yeah, it's, it's really important and we were aware that we could signpost people on, but East Meets West is a very safe space for the women where they do go with their problems um, to, for support. So yeah, absolutely, it's really important. Great, we've got two more questions, probably got time for both of them. So I can't see who number one Jamie. is. Jamie. 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 Jamie, yeah. Hi, um, uh, I'm just wondering whether or not um, 
you're still trying to engage in more refugees to be part of this project, um, especially around the Liverpool area, because I've got, I know a friend who's a public advisor who could, um, who runs a refugee center called um, African Voices, etc. African Voices, whatever. And um, I could get you in contact with that public advisor and, and you could be, get more uh, refugees to be part of this wonderful project. Yeah, that would be fantastic. Yeah, I did have a connection at Refugee Women Connect, but yeah, that would be brilliant because we do want to try it in a bigger way. So yes, that'd be fabulous. Thank you. Well, are, are you going to be at the afternoon session? Yes, I'll be at some of it. I have to pop out, but I'll be, yeah, I will be there. Okay, I'll give you I'll give you his email address and contact details. Thank you. Thanks very much. Uh, and Claire Maxwell? Um, yeah, Amanda, it, it reminds me very much of the Liverpool Museum House of Memories. I don't know if you've seen that project. No, no, I don't know that. Um, have a look at it. It's really exciting what they've done. It's a completely different subject in terms of people bringing objects who are suffering from dementia. But it's the way then that they've plated them all and put them on an app so other people can view them and and it's been really well evaluated and it feels like the same sort of work but obviously a different participants but I suppose it's, it will be your next steps and you know I don't know what they are but it's just really exciting I think it's a fabulous project yeah. Thank you and I didn't say our next step is actually the community exhibition so we've taken we've taken the photographs and they're being blown up to when we get some money blown up to AO size poster size um, and we're going to host a community exhibition um, in Lancaster there's a community centre that will host them and then we're also going to approach the RLI the maternity unit because all the babies were born there so that's the next step is the community um, exhibition which the women are very excited about because they'll we'll ask them to choose which images they want and they'll curate it and then we'll also um, give all the women their, Im their images, a set of their images as well. So they'll have these beautiful images mm -hmm. and then we'll go back and ask them which of their images they, they want. So the lady who bought the bag of pink things, she can choose which, which one she wants. So that's the next step, which sounds really interesting, that curating it in a way. Yeah, thank you. Thanks very much, thanks Mary Claire. And for... <laughs> Online. She's just messaged to say she's struggling with connections. All right. Um, and, uh, okay. Hopefully we can get everybody can take a breath in um, while we wait for Joe to come online. <coughs> we want to chat in the room or drink or something. Oh yeah. It's okay, Joe, can you hear? Yeah. We're just, just to some people off to the loo and have a drink, so we'll reconvene in a couple of minutes. Okay. Thank you. Can you hear me all right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, yeah. Hello. Hello? I'm going to have to share um, the slides now. I'm going to find that Okay, so have you sent them to. Yeah, that? I've got them. them. Okay. Yeah, well, let's see if we can get them shared then and see them on the screen and then we'll know it actually works. Yeah. Fine, they'll come oh, okay. to go. Yeah. yeah, all right, cool. Yeah, so about yeah, a couple of minutes and then we'll, we'll hit the go button. Thanks very much for coming.
Okay, we're going to just reconvene then. So, just give Joe a very full time. So I can hear you very well. Um, so just, uh, and the other thing is, of course, because. Amanda's sharing. She's going to also have to move the slides on. I'm sorry about that. Just emailing you, Joe. That's fine. Brilliant. So I'll just do, do. We've got one more person to get back in the room, but we'll start anyway. Um, and we've got a lot of people online, so hopefully between us, it's always, as you said earlier, always to organise these hybrid events. But hopefully we're going to move it forward. So to introduce distinguished professor Joe Rycroft Malone from Lancaster University who is Executive Dean of the Faculty of Medicine and Health there with a background in mixed methods and applied research amongst many other things. Um, and you previously were the director, weren't you, of HS and DR for the, for the NHR and now chair of the NICE Implementation Strategy Group. So a wide range of roles and, and engagement um, around NICE and the NHR and with a particular expertise in realist research. And I think this is important because I think it's become quite sexy to do realist research and I think people tend to think they're doing it when they're not necessarily doing it so I think it's really quite good to to have some expert input into what this really means so thank you Joe over to you thank you so um, I think that's a really good um, sort of way into this um, what I've called a, a brief tour and it, it can only be a brief tour given the time that we've got together um, this morning but it's one of the reasons if if we go to the next slide why I am going to spend a bit of time on um, not only what is realist research, why would we want to do it, but um, also the where it comes from, the sort of philosophical underpinnings, um, because I think those are important foundations to understanding um, the way uh, that realist research might be different from um, mixed methods research in general, for example. So I'm going to cover a bit of um, the bit of the philosophy. Uh, philosophical understandings, um, talk a, a, a little bit around what um, context mechanisms and outcomes are, then go um, through a, a realist review uh, cycle and what I'll do is I'll do my best to point out where I think um, doing a realist review might be different from doing a any other type of sort of general evidence synthesis or evidence review and then briefly finish with what I think might be some of the qualities really that are required if you're going to embark on um, doing realist research which some of you have already might have already done and if I was in the room and I could see you I'd, I would ask that question because I'm not sure where we're starting from in terms of your understanding about realist research, but I, I'm sort of taking a middle ground here in terms of some people might have some knowledge and other people might not have any knowledge. So um, why, what, what is um, realist research and why would we be interested in doing it? So um, 
we are interested, we, we might be interested in, in doing Moon's research if we want to try and find out why things work and why things don't work. So if we go on to the next um, slide, uh, there are a number of things that characterise realist research and you hear a lot about um, realist research being theory driven. So uh, whether you're doing a, an evidence synthesis, a realist review, um, you can use the term either way, um, it's fine to call it a, a realist synthesis or um, a, a realist review. But also if you're doing an evaluation, so you'll hear a lot about um, these approaches being theory driven. And as I said, Realist research really seeks to um, provide an explanation um, rather than just a description um, about why things work or why things don't work. And I want to say things, I mean programmes or interventions and how they work in the real context um, of, in, in, in my case, a lot of the work that I've done is in, in practice, in policy. Um, so that's the second bullet point, if you wouldn't mind just flicking on the, the slide. And then if we come to the third bullet point, what we get from doing realist research, whether that be a synthesis or an evaluation, is essentially a, a, what I've called here a, a, an explanatory model, an explanatory framework. It is a, a set of theory driven recommendations really about how and why programmes interventions may or may not work in the in, in the real life of um, of practice. So that's why you might want to do um, a realist piece of work. You're interested in finding out um, why something may or may not work in the real world of practice. And you'll hear very often when you, uh, when um, you talk about realist research, um, this this sort of sentence or question about what works for whom, how, why and in what context and that brings us to the to the next slide and and this is around and, and for those of you who've done any sort of evaluation work or tried to put anything into practice you'll know that sometimes some things might work more or less in in one context one place with one group of people but when they, you try to do that in a different context it might not work for a whole variety of reasons. So context is really important when we think about why we might want to do realist research. And as I say, you'll often hear um, the what works, for whom, how, why, and in what context as a way, as a shorthand, if you like, for doing a realist um, inquiry. So the um, underpinnings of realist research sort of philosophical underpinnings and, and leading then to thinking um, about context mechanisms and outcomes. Um, so if we flick on to the next um, slide, and, and you'll see these, and, and I'll, I've got a, a slide at the end from resources to, for you to refer to. The, these, these little cartoons are from the Ramesses project, and the Ramesses project actually was funded by the um, Health and Care Service Delivery Research Programme. A number of years now, um, they set up a, a, a series of um, a two, two, two projects focusing on uh, realist synthesis and realist uh, evaluation and publication, some publication um, principles and guidance. And, and what they've done is some cool little cartoons to explain some of the, the some of the features of, of realist research. So I've, I've pinched some of those for this, this presentation. So as this as this um, cartoon suggests, where realist sits from a, a epistemological point of view is in between constructivism and positivism. So on the next slide, you'll see that represented um, as a continuum. So this is this is this point around understanding that interventions programs um, work, are, are part of and operate within the reality of, of a practice environment. So um, we'd sit between understanding um, the world that you know you can you can you can really clearly observe things, and you might, for example, under the positivism umbrella, do a trial to um, articulate uh, what you are observing and explain what you're observing. Constructivism is that you never really know, so you're constructing a, real, uh, a reality from people's, usually people's interpretation um, of their world. Whereas real, realism is, is somewhere in the middle. Um, it can't be directly measured um, because we do process, because it, it believes that we do process things through our through our brains and therefore through our language and through our culture, et cetera, et cetera. 
Um, and so it, it can't be known indirectly. And that's a really important when we come to talk about what mechanisms are. So programmes might um, therefore change within different contexts and therefore participants might react differently to those um, interventions and programmes in those different contexts. That's a very um, brief where it sits between constructivism and positivism. And the other defining feature of realist research is this idea of causation. As I mentioned trials earlier, where we try and intervene to try and make an effect between um, X and Y. Um, when we when we uh, try and observe an effect between X and Y, whereas um, there's a which is called successionist model model of causation within realist research, we talk about a, gen, a generative um, approach to causation where um, we really do we try and get under the skin of what it is about that intervention that program that might be leading to the outcome, um, and so this is what leads us on to thinking about. Um, context and mechanisms and outcomes. So you'll, you'll hear a lot about um, context mechanisms and outcomes in relation to realist research. Um, and the next slide summarizes, summarizes what context mechanisms and outcomes um, broadly are. Uh, and I will, I'll spend a bit more time um, unpacking this, but um, realist research is very much characterised by the mechanisms operating within different contexts leading to out, uh, outcomes, both short, medium and long term. So if we go to the next slide where context is unpacked um, a little bit more. So context isn't in realist research. It's not just about, for example, the clinical context in which something might be operating. It could be um, a political context, it could be um, a, an economic context, uh, it could be um, a cultural context. So context is a condition is, is more as I would describe it when I'm talking to people about doing realist work. Um, it, I think it's more helpful to think about context as a condition as the conditions, the conditions in um, in which different mechanisms might fire. And what you find is that when you're doing realist research, that are, those conditions, those contexts often have lots of layers within them. But it's these context, this, these contexts, these conditions that really act as the, uh, either the facilitators or the barriers to tri triggering um, uh, particular mechanisms. Um, uh, mechanisms within realist research are um, as I said earlier in that earlier slide, it, it's very much about what it is about the uh, the intervention or the program that you're studying. What is what is it that's making it work or not work? Um, and so people respond differently to different um, interventions, to different programs, um, and that 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 response um, offers different ways of reacting to those interventions and those programmes. And, and as this slide indicates, often um, this reasoning, uh, the response and then uh, the, the reasoning, uh, uh, the sort of the activity, the behaviour and the feeling um, about that response might not be obvious. And that's where it becomes tricky when you do realist research. And, and Sue said earlier that some, you know, often people think they're doing realist research and you read realist research and actually when you get under the skin of it, it's not really realist research. And I think it's largely because of this feature of realist research, which, are, uh, which is the feature of mechanisms that are fired within different contexts that lead to um, different outcomes. And the next slide uh, unpacks a little bit about what those outcomes um, outcomes might be. So very much this idea of uh, generative causation, this interaction between context and mechanism um, leading to different types of outcomes. And, and you may um, may be able to uh, anticipate some of those so then some of those might be intended but those might some of those might not be intended so it's very much about capturing both intended and unintended outcomes and we tend to um, we tend to try and um, capture those outcomes in different ways and they could be actually I said in, in this slide quantitative or qualitative but actually often it's qualitative and quantitative and qualitative. Um, so you'll often see research that's multi-method um, when you see people reporting on realist inquiry. So that's a quick 
skip through um, the sort of underpinnings, if you like, of realist research. So if we come then specifically to realist reviews, or as I mentioned earlier, realist syntheses, and if you do get people that have got around to analyze this guidance, you'll see that um, either is fine um, from a publication uh, guidance perspective, it's fine to use either label. Um, so why would you want to do a realist review? Um, it's a, if, we, if, if you're interested on understanding, for example, um, the evidence for the way that different interventions, usually typically complex interventions, are both implemented um, and or delivered and, have an, and how they're having or may be having an impact in the real world. So very much uh, as I started out this, this brief tour, very much about understanding how something might, might or might not work in um, the, the real world. And I, again, as I started out, um, what does the evidence tell us? How does it explain um, why this programme or this intervention may work or may not work um, for, for people? Uh, how and in what, in what context? So this idea of better understanding how things might or might not work in different contexts and, and specifically in terms of realist reviews, realist synthesis, gathering the evidence together to give us an explanation about that. So why, you, you may be interested in um, using a realist uh, review approach to um, indeed extend existing systematic reviews. Sometimes um, you might find that systematic reviews and or meta-analyses for that matter may provide a partial explanation. Typically, um, not, um, and so you might want to extend a systematic review to provide a bit more of an explanation about what's going on here. Um, you may want to know more about um, how and when to use an intervention in practice. So um, the start of a study, for example, um, it might be useful to know a bit more about uh, why or might why or why not something might work in practice to help inform how you might then go about implementing that intervention in practice you may indeed want to know um, what sort of program so the features of different programs that might um, work in the real world of practice and realist research gives you that sort of theoretical insight into uh, why a program might work and, and a realist synthesis give, will, will help you with ga gathering the evidence in a theory informed way to make that um, judgment. And then more and more, um, I'm certainly I'm seeing in the literature uh, people using realist reviews, realist syntheses to um, start out on the development of, in, of new interventions themselves and, and typically those are what I might call um, new complex interventions. So trying to piece together the evidence to parcel um, interventions then to, to, to evaluate, to, to put into practice and, and to evaluate. So that they might be some of the reasons um, why you want to do a realist review. Um, how are they different? How is a realist synthesis, a realist review different from, a, for example, a systematic review. This, and, and I'm obviously, I'm very happy for these for these slides to be shared. There is <coughs> bones here on this slide that um, highlight how um, uh, that they might be different. I think one of the uh, that I've stressed already is around this idea of theory, um, and, and theory is very much um, a broad conceptualization of theory within realist research. The other feature um, is around uh, a more iterative approach to doing um, a review, which is focused on developing and refining that theory that you start off uh, to articulate. Um, it's also, I think, a more inclusive approach in terms of the types of evidence that you might include um, in a review. Um, and I think my sense of a realist synthesis over a sort of standard systematic review is that point around providing findings that are um, focused on action, um, but also focused on explanation. Um, so those, I think, are some of the features that might make um, a realist synthesis, realist review different from, a, if you like, a standard um, systematic review. But let's go through um a, a sort of a real a cycle if you like of a of a realist review and I, as i say I, I haven't got time to be ex exhaustive here so because it'll be good to 
um, have a conversation about any questions or any observations you have and leave time for that. But what I'll do is I'll try and focus on those features that I think do make um, realist reviews uh, a, a little different from other types of reviews. So in terms of that first stage, um, and if we go on to the next slide, we start with uh, developing a programme theory that you um, want to test through the realist review process. Um, and you tend to do that um, through um, engaging um, very much with stakeholders. And in, indeed, that is one of the features, um, certainly in the realist work that I do, um, including realist reviews, that it makes it quite um, an engaged process because you're interested in working with stakeholders to better understand what they think may or may not work with this particular thing that you're studying, this particular programme, this particular intervention that you're trying to gather evidence about. So very much starting with the view of stakeholders. What do they think may or may not work um, with this particular intervention? Um, and then you and then you start to gather that and start to put that alongside perhaps a scoping, a broad scoping of the literature, which which you might do through which you might um, come to a, a to um, understand through what I've called here a concept mining process. So pulling out of the literature that you've scoped some of the key concepts. What are some of the key things? Um, that, may, that you might start to develop and build this initial um, programme theory development. Also, there are different ways you'll see in the literature that people will have this engagement with different st stakeholders and work up these different uh, approach, uh, different types of theories that you might start off with. So interviews might be one, um, one way. Um, I've been involved in Lego Serious Play so as an activity. Um, you'll see reference to soft systems methodologies being used at this stage. So there really is a variety in the toolkit in terms of how you start to develop um, the, these initial program theories. But these are a, 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 the actual the, the essential starting point for your realist review. So um, the, the essential starting point is to craft these initial program theories that you then go on uh, refine and test through the review process. And what you'll see in the literature is a, a variation. So you'll see some people um, articulating those initial program theories as context mechanisms and outcome configurations. You'll sometimes see those expressed as if then statements. So if something um, is put into practice in this way, then this might lead to those types of um, initial statements. There's no um, right or wrong way. Um, what you will see in the Ramesses uh, guidance is a focus on ensuring that through the review process you do come to articulating context mechanism and outcome configurations. Now that could be earlier or later in the review process. There's no, there's no right or wrong on that. So then if we go to um, the search and, and extraction of data, um, and again, I've tried to articulate here what is uh, what is different from um, a, 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 a typical, if you like, evidence review process. So searching and searching of the data, searching for data is much more purposive. So you've got your initial program theories, and then what you do is you search the, um, search the database, uh, databases based on search terms that you've developed from those initial program theories. So it's much more purposive, purposive, much more focused, much more targeted. And then it also I would say it's much more iterative. So you tend to start um, broad with those initial program theories, searching, um, searching with the, the concepts that are in those initial process, pro, um, in initial program theories. Um, and then over time, you start to iterate, you start to start from the broad to start to focus, focus in and focus down. You, you, you're interested when you're doing realist reviews on um, capturing multiple sources of evidence. So that ranges from um, your uh, typical research pieces of evidence based on um, based on primary research very much through to uh, grey literature, the sort of policy documents that you might find that are of interest in helping you understand um, what people uh, are intending um, in relation to the implementation and evaluation of this particular 
um, thing that you're trying to understand more about. So often these sort of um, policy documents that sit on people's shelves are, are an interesting source of evidence in, in realist reviews. It helps um, provide some colour to some of the research evidence that you might get through typical database, database um, searching. The other source of evidence that um, is important to um, reflect on is uh, the theoretical evidence. So, um, it, it, with as I mentioned earlier, evidence th synthesis, evidence inquiry is very much around a theoretical um, understanding of how things may or may not work. Now, it may be useful at the early stage to bring in um, other types of theory into understanding what might be going on here. So, if you're understanding around, if you want to understand, for example, how something might be working in a particular practice context, you might want to draw, draw on organisational theories. Culture theory would be um, an example. Different sorts of cultural theory might be an example of example there. If you're wanting to understand how um, an education program um, might be working, uh, might might may or may not work in practice, you might want to draw on learning theory. Um, and so, pulling in different sources of theory is absolutely. Um, an accepted uh, type of evidence to bring into a realist review uh, process. The other distinction with, um, no, so if we can just keep on that other one, sorry, I'm just going to talk about that last bullet point on the searching and extraction. Thank you, I exerted that, that slide. Um, the other thing to, to draw attention to is um, in terms of data extraction, when you've got your pieces of evidence together and when you're extracting from those pieces of evidence, is that your, your data extraction is framed around those initial programme theories so that what you are doing is ensuring that those initial programme theories, you're refining and testing those through the, through the review process. So you're extracting data based on those initial programme theories. And I tend to... Um, advise that you set up a bespoke, what I've called here a bespoke data extraction form. So yes, if we can move on to the, on to the next the next slide. Um, there's some debate in the literature. Again, there's no right or wrong way of doing this, but there is some debate in the literature around whether you need to appraise the quality of evidence. I've already said that it's um, a very broad church in terms of the evidence that you can include in a realist synthesis. Um, and therefore, there is a question around how you appraise uh, uh, different sources of, um, of, of, of a broad church of an evidence base. The test of um, the test of whether an, uh, evidence is fit for purpose is the test that you use in realist review. So, in particular, is this evidence, is this piece of evidence, or is part of this piece of evidence that you're looking at, does it help you understand the, the theories that you're trying to test? And in relation to rigour, so relevance and rigour, uh, rigour, does the evidence that you're looking at, does it help you, does, does the research itself or the piece of evidence, does it help um, you understand um, how the, help you understand how the researchers or how the people who are the authors of that piece of evidence, how, how they've come to their conclusions? Is, it, is there some sort of um, um, auditable um, trail in terms of uh, understanding how they've reached their conclusions. So a very different way than, a, for example, um, a, a particular applying a particular a particular appraisal tool to a piece of evidence is, is the idea of relevance and rigour. That said, um, you will see examples of realist research uh, where people do apply appraisal tools. Um, and that, as I said, is, is fine. There's no right or wrong um, in, in respect to that. The key feature, as I've identified here, are these tests of, is this evidence fit for purpose? Is it relevant? Is it rigorous? So then we go on to um, the synthesis process. And this is, I think, um, in my experience, the, the, well, the, the two trickiest parts are one coming to those initial program theories and then I think the other tricky um, phase of, of realist uh, synthesis is, is this, is when you're trying to pull all these different sources, uh, sources of evidence together across those initial program theories that you captured in your data extraction forms and how you do that. Um, 
that and there are, there are different ways you'll see in the literature different ways that people do that and and you know the, from the post-it note type way and flip chart type way to the using en vivo type way and it's useful to have a look at the different strengths and weaknesses of those approaches but essentially the basic task that you're trying to do when you're trying to synthesize these sources of evidence is essentially refining the program theories that you started off with um, and you, you do that by looking at evidence that um, supports those initial program theories that you started off with, but you're also trying to look for evidence that doesn't um, support, so that counterfactual evidence, because that is the evidence often that helps you generate new insight and helps you refine things um, through, the, through the review process. My experience is that it, this, this part of the process is, is, is best done through um, deliberation, through i.e. through discussion, um, and and that's where I think that um, really synthesis. It's not a sort of um, a lone task. It's very much I think a team-based process where uh, it's important that you get different pers perspectives um, in that pro in the process, and particularly in this process of synthesis. So that you're you're comparing and cr contrasting across the pieces of evidence. You're trying to refine. Um, those program theories through a deliberative process that they will then give you some output that enables you to go into what's called um, teacher learner interviews or discussions. So you'll have a, out of this synthesis process, you'll have a more refined set of initial program theories that you will want to go out and test with your stakeholders. So does this make sense to you? Does it, if it doesn't, why? Is there anything that you would want to add to this? So it's a, it's a way these teacher learner interviews discussions are a way of um, uh, of just of sense checking really the, the findings that have come out of your out of your review. Um, and so what you end up with um, as your findings are essentially a set of CM of, of context mechanisms and outcomes. And you'll see in examples that have been published varying depth. De levels of detail um, and varying varying levels of numbers of the set of contexts and mechanisms and outcomes that you might come out of the review process with. You'll also see different ways of presenting those. Um, you, uh, what I tend to do um, is, and I think I've got an example on the next slide, but we'll hold that for just a few seconds, um, is, is pro provide a, a summary of the context mechanism and outcome read. And then underneath that summary, present a, a little bit of a narrative um, which provides an explanation of that context and mechanism thread and the, um, the, the evidence that supports, um, supports that. Uh, so that's where you bring in um, references essentially to the evidence that you've included in your synthesis. And also, um, it's, it's, it's often quite uh, helpful, particularly for those, uh, particularly when you're studying um, topics that are very pra practice orientated, sort of providing some what I've called here scenarios or vignettes that bring really um, to life uh, the, the, the things that you're meant, the things that you've articulated in your context me mechanism and outcome threads and, and the narrative that you provided to, under, to, to underpin those context and mechanisms and outcome threads. And so I've got an example on the next slide of, um, of, of one um, context mechanism and outcome thread, which was kept, comes from a review um, that I did a few years ago with colleagues looking at um, how we uh, support support workers um, the, uh, in, in um, developing their skills and expertise, particularly in, in relation to care of um, older people. And so I've got a, um, a context mechanism outcome thread in this first bullet point um, where you'll see the context here is if an intervention um, for these particular support workers is delivered um, as both designed and delivered as close as possible to the work of the support worker, then this um, prompts a, a resonance in that support worker participating in the in the intervention. So that that's the mechanism. The mechanism here is, is resonance, which then can lead to both um, different ways of thinking, so cognitive changes, different ways of thinking about the particular issue, and also potentially, but not always, in helping them do things differently, improving things for um, people who are in receipt of care. So um, a number of different outcome potential outcomes there. And then, so underneath that 
that, that would that would be what I describe as the context mechanism and outcome thread. Underneath that, what we what we described are the sorts of um, ways in which um, it, uh, training could be designed and, and delivered, and there's some example there. The ways in which um, the the supervision of practice can become close to um, the individual participating in it. So that's the next bullet point in relation to that potentially being both group and one-to-one -one supervision, which um, enhances the potential to uh, resonate with individuals. Um, but is also there was also something in this review around important to bring um, care support workers together, um, working together in, sh in terms of sharing their experiences, um, in terms of different ways of doing that, for example, case conferences, which is the next bullet point. Um, but then also at the last bullet point, um, as, a, as by way of explaining what was going on here, that it also was around providing examples for people in uh, participating in, these tra in this training to um, real life examples so that people could resonate with the examples that were in the training. So that is just one um, example of a context mechanism now kind of thread in the way that um, we unpack that and there is a reference at the bottom of that slide if you're interested in finding out more about that particular review so uh, moving on uh, just the last few minutes of what um, what I think are the qualities of a realist researcher having done realist research now for quite a number of years um, and so Born the scars, if you like, um, and supported others in in um, in experiencing those scars. So, on the next slide, you'll see a list of. And if you could just um, run through those straight away, um, Miranda, that's fine. I I, I um, think that um, realist research, and I'd be interested um, to hear from those who have done realist research uh, whether you agree with this. Um, I think you need to have what I would call a flexible brain. So you, you'll understand from even the, the, the sort of brief tour that I've given you that there's quite a lot of dealing with um, different sources of evidence at different levels of, of, of actually quite a slippery con concept. So the idea of mechanisms is actually quite a slippery concept. So I think you have to have, have to have a brain that can deal with complexity and I call that a flexible brain. I do think you need need to have a level of creativity, you know, the sense of when you come to developing those initial program theories, the way to get the most out of people, that, uh, the, the stakeholders that you're engaging with is often um, you need to be creative, but also um, in synthesising different sources of evidence, you do need to have um, a, a, an ability to think creatively, I think. Definitely, as you, uh, as, as I've intimated, um, a, a, an ability to be able to deal with complex and complexity and messiness. And I, I have put and, and enjoy, because if you don't enjoy that, if you don't enjoy working through complexity and you don't mind that messiness, then probably realist research isn't for you. Ray Paulson, in his early work, um, suggested um, that the realist reviews are, or a realist inquiry actually isn't, isn't for novices. And I do understand why he says that. Um, and I think we might reflect on that a little bit for those of you who've been involved in realist research. And I think you, you'll have also got the sense that um, it's quite an involved process. So it does require um, resources, include resources, i.e. people, uh, i.e ideally um, resource um, to enable you to engage fully with stakeholders and with the databases that you need to and with other sources of evidence that you need to and of course um, resource in terms of time um, they, the realist reviews aren't necessarily particularly quick to do so finally on the last slide I've, I've listed a few um, resources I haven't listed references you it's very easy to search now that uh, as Sue said become very popular um, realist research and you'll find lots and lots of examples of realist reviews out there but the, these are sort of standard training type materials that I've listed in this last slide and I'm hoping that I've left enough time to have um, any questions or a bit of a chat about what I've said so I'll finish there. Thanks very much Joe. <laughs> You've actually finished precisely on time, but I think oh, we'll, give, we'll leave five minutes <laughs> because I'm sure there will be some questions. And I would just like to echo the novices thing, having been involved in a few realist reviews. I think 
personally, my experience is you have to be able to know the rules, stick with them when they need to be stuck to, but also be prepared to break them. And I think to do that, you, you, it's not a it's not a cookbook methodology. You know, you have to actually have a broad understanding of the whole range of methods that come into play and know when to yeah when to break the rules basically. So I would put that on the on the table for discussion potentially. Yeah. But it's about that. Yeah, and I didn't I didn't say and I, 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 mm. I used the word, but you know you're right. So it's not a cookbook. It's I call I call it. Um, there's a set of principles, aren't there? There are a set of principles that you need to be um, faithful to, but um, beyond that, um, that's where you've got the flexibility to be able to um, be creative. Yeah, absolutely agree. So, anybody in the room? Yeah, we'll go around. So, <laughs> I it's partly just following off what you just said, really. I mean, I, I get the impression that it's probably not an ideal methodology to use for student research for a PhD. I don't know what you'd think about that. <laughs> I would, um, I would, I would say probably not, but caveat that with, um, it depends. On what, on how much of the realist piece of work makes up the thesis. So, um, it, you know, a realist review in itself can include primary so sources of data collection. So, you know, I have seen examples of a PhD thesis being a realist synthesis. Obviously, that would need, you know, there are other aspects that we, one would think about, need to think about, wouldn't one, if, if one was being advised and saying, oh, you've only done a realist review. Um, you, as we know, when you do a realist review, it's much more involved than that. So I would say, yes, but, I mean, answer to your question, it, 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 I would think more than once about doing a realist review as part of a PhD study. Yeah, and I would caveat that as well with, you know, you have to have a good supervisory team who really yeah. understands realist, realist mm -hmm. approaches because, a lot of people think they do, but they don't. And yeah. I think a student awash with people that you're know, in a sea yeah. of their PhD with somebody who doesn't know what they're doing, doing a realist review. Yeah, very... and it's not helpful to have a supervisory team who um, are, are not um, either either knowledgeable or it, even if not knowledgeable, accepting of um, a sort of different worldview on how to do a review. And also finding your, your uh, examiner is it's also very important. Just ask a quick question. So, with the search and screening part, um, do you screen all the results of your searches, or is it much? Is it less prescriptive than in a standard systematic review? Would you kind of have a more? I'm just thinking through, like how you know normally you kind of do a big search and everything gets screened and it moves down the line yeah. like that. Yeah, you tend you do broadly. Yes, I mean you tend to focus on. So when you would be looking, for example, at the titles, you'd be trying to tune into those in relation to the initial program theories, um, and then typically we'll go there. Oh yeah, that looks about right. You then go to the abstract. So yeah, broadly, yes, um, you, you you do, but but you, you the lens in which you're looking at it might it might be a little bit different. In terms of um, making recommendations to practice, evidence-based practice, where does this kind of thing in? Because obviously, for example, the NHS wants to know whether an intervention is effective or not. Uh, do they actually want to know this kind of evidence that that can make a difference in terms of what? Cause, because I was thinking that with with a, a normal systematic review, we would kind of get the big picture, the big numbers of how many, like for example, 90% of people would benefit from CBT, but maybe this could give the answer to the 10% the that could that can benefit from CBT. So how does this fit in with that providing recommendations? Oh, I think Joe's perspective from NICE would be excellent here. So <laughs> how, how does NICE handle this kind of uh, information, Joe? Well, uh, I, yeah, well, that's a whole other session, isn't it? <laughs> so uh, I think this goes to why you would do a realist review. The question about why you would do a realist review. You wouldn't do uh, you wouldn't do a realist review, obviously, if you wanted to answer questions of effectiveness. Um, you'd want to you do a realist review, and this is where I think it is. This is where I think that um, it is useful in terms of practice. You do a realist review if you wanted to find out how you might implement something in practice and what may or may not work in practice. So it gives you 
a different sort of evidence than a nice effectiveness sort of evidence. So I, what we are seeing, be interesting, I don't know um, sort of the, the makeup of the, the group today, but um, what we are seeing is increasing interest, I think, from people in practice to better understand how things may or may not work in practice to help understand then how services may or may not um, be able to deliver different interventions in practice. So it's so I mean, in terms of nice, going but right back in circle, nice, as you know, nice, nice are very clear about their hierarchy of evidence. It's a different question and a different source of evidence. So this is very much um, helping people understand if if interventions and typically complex interventions, service type interventions, may or may not work in practice. So I, it, I'm seeing. An, I think that's why we're seeing an increasing use of realist research actually, because there is an increasing appetite for that. Yeah. Thanks. So I don't know if anybody else online has got. Nobody's got their hand up as far as I can see. I'm sure that doesn't mean they don't want to talk to you, but you know, it may be that it needs a longer conversation. Yeah. Well, I'm happy to do it. We all can do a longer session in the future if, it, if there's some appetite for it, because um, obviously we've probably not just done it justice in half an hour. Um, yeah, and it may it may well be the implementation piece might be because there are there's a mixture of academics and, clin and clinical practitioners here you know, online and, and uh, in the room. So that that translation to implementation question might be the one that we might want to pick up on. Yeah. yeah. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Thanks, Thank Joe. You. Yes. You're very welcome. Sorry, I'm not there. I've got. I'm heading off to graduations now. Oh, enjoy. Enjoy. Yeah. Okay. Take bye care. Bye bye. Bye bye. Yeah. Bye bye. Yeah. bye, -bye. Yeah. bye, -bye. Okay. Um, so for those who haven't didn't get a drink last time, want to get a drink, and then I'll hand over to Kirsty for the next session. Yeah. Yeah. Those online, we're just taking on a couple of minutes to get a break, so you can do the same thing. Thanks, thanks, um, Mandy, for expertly being the slides on. No pressure, no pressure. No pressure. Showing us in the room when somebody talks. Okay, I'm going to just have a quick play in the brain now. Figure out why. Probably shouldn't pay over it. It should be picking up. Yeah, but I've seen them to kind of scribble. Yeah, I was going to say it's not moving. When somebody speaks, okay. I mean, as far as I can see, the settings, the settings are right. So. Yeah. Um, yeah. 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 Ye
Okay, are we all sort of back? Something's still out, something's still away. I see this is on. Let's just, just check this box. Maybe you've got cookies instead. Yeah, so ladies said it was like lunch. Looks like you sort of like something that was Okay, people online back. Voice well, month's not back yet, so we wait for her to come back. Sorry, online people. It was a few minutes till Monday reappeared just in case you've got any technical issues. Oh, yeah, yeah. that's really fun. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like when you co-authors. Yeah. <laughs> 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 By the way, well done for getting the bin. I didn't tell you that. Brilliant job. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Having to say yeah. we're going to do it and then yeah. Yeah. getting it done. Yeah. 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 Enjoy yourself. Yeah. I think we're trying to Yeah, no, I think you're right. I think it helps with the next year. They can really push things through. Yeah, just things out. So, showing up, thinking, so, it's brilliant. Honestly, it's a holiday this week, and we've got some of the stuff to get done with the big time. It's a nice cruise. Check this out. I really want you to do this. Thanks, Mandy. Okay. Well, let's go. Hopefully everybody online is back and, and uh, ready. Go, go, go. Okay. Um, so I'm talking about um, generative AI in the HEI, which is my poem for today. <laughs> <laughs> so HEI in case uh, it's universities really, but, um, I couldn't resist the, the rhyming um, title. Um, so I've just been putting together some thoughts about generative AI and what it means for us all as researchers and how it affects our work environment. Um, but I do really need to start by saying I'm, I'm a course of researcher in maternity care and I'm absolutely no expert on generative AI. You know, this is not something I understand well. I've just been following it in the news because I said I'd um, take on talking about it and the idea is that it's, it's a session. I've got a short presentation but it prompts discussion really. It's not um, it's not um, informative, I feel a bit, you know, following Joe, <laughs> who's got such expertise in Realist Review. I'm just sort of giving some ideas and thoughts, really. Um, so, Susan, um, you might have that I've acknowledged some slightly unusual co authors. Um, my new co author, my new co authors include ChatGPT, uh, because I did ask it some questions <laughs> to see what it thought, um, and I included its answers. It was very helpful. Um, and I also realised that lots of things that I'm more used to using are generative AI driven, they're algorithm driven, so things like Google Images and PowerPoint Slide um, Developer, this is AI already in our lives, mm. it's mm. snuck in through the back door, we didn't stop and think about it, but we're a little bit more concerned maybe about the generative AI. Um, so what is it, what are we talking about here today, what is generative um, AI? Well, this is um, text directly from Wikipedia. Thanks, Ricky. 
So Wikipedia said generative artificial intelligence or generative AI is a type of artificial intelligence capable of generating text, images or media in response to prompts. I've felt emboldened those last few words because they're really important, it's crucial. Because previously people had to write code to generate new stuff and now we don't. So anyone with a key keyboard can effectively create new things, media, text, whatever, by just asking GPT. There's lots of other similar um, coding machines, uh, sorry, generative machines out, but um, it just widens our application because everyone can do it. If you've got a keyboard and a computer, you can do this. So that's a big difference. And then it says, generative AI models learn the patterns and structure of their input training data and then generate new data that has similar characteristics. Well, for me, that bit was gobbledygook. I have no idea what it's talking about. Um, but I've learned, or I've discovered, it means that the machine learns about human language by, and images by harvesting billions of examples from across the web. Um, and the web, um, and the machine then teaches itself to sound human or to look human in effect. Um, and yes, that's the web, the home of Wikipedia, of course. <coughs> but also the home of everything that's ever been posted by anyone, the home of WhatsApp, the home of Twitter, the home of Facebook, um, and what some sources have um, described as the disaster of disinformation. So they're, therein lies part of the problem, right? That it brings in information from <coughs> wide sources um, and that teaches it to understand what human is. Um, so with that Wikipedia definition, I found it quite difficult to, to make sense of so I asked, that's what I put in ChatGPT and uh, paid £2.84 for a 14-day trial. <laughs> I felt it was affordable, thank you, so get you in quite easily. So I asked um, ChatGPT um, what um, generative AI is. And it said, well, AI or artificial intelligence is a technology that allows computers to think and learn like humans. It helps machines understand images, speech and text, and can even drive cars. It aims to make our lives easier by enabling machines to do complex tasks independently. So for me, herein lies the problem. The chat GPT bot wrote a much clearer explanation than human that, human that explained it on Wikipedia. And actually, it also shortened this for me because I said, that's a bit long. First, first, uh, first edition was a little bit long, so it just shortened it for me. Um, and it just sounds quite helpful. Um, and just, just so the GPT, but I had to look it up, it means generated pre-trained transformer. So I think we can see why they're using the acronym. <laughs> much use. And just as a side note, every image that I found with um, chat GPT or similar things, um, it's very often a human-like female. And it's very often aesthetically beautiful in a sort of westernized sense. And it very often is looking away, just slightly and that was submitted. So I think it's quite, uh, the imagery is quite interesting to me. Um, uh, it's, uh, it's being sold uh, uh, worldwide. So, okay, that's some definitions of what it is, but what can it really do? Um, so in practical terms, it's quite easy to see quickly why generative AI is useful. Um, and the top few bullet points are a summary from the Verb, um, sorry, The Verge, which is a tech news website in the States. So it says you know, it can help you write emails and memos. If you're pondering, you know, how do I phrase this so it'll be acceptable to someone who might not want this message, it'll do that for you. Spruce up your slide desks, uh, decks, which I could have asked to done if I'd quite known how to do that, but I don't. Um, correct mistakes in your spreadsheets, edit your photos better, write code, and in many cases, just do it for you. So if you are someone that does need to write code, feel like ChatGPT can do that and take that over. So then I said, OK, well, I asked ChatGPT again, what could it do for university staff? And it volunteered then to write texts, essays, papers and reports, to grade essays. <laughs> <laughs> you can understand the attraction <coughs> and to provide feedback to students, to analyse data sets, to identify patterns, to extract data. So this is the work, isn't it? The core cool work of us as college of researchers. It can, it can, or claims to do that. Um, not maybe in the deep methodological ways we think about when we're talking about realist review or phenomenology, but it can, it can um, look at very large sets of data and do some of that work for us. 
and a host of administrative work, scheduling things, enrolment, and it described that as freeing up staff for other tasks. So I kind of had a bit of a worried face there because we know that freeing up can mean freeing people from being employed. <laughs> Sticking with, you know, what can it do for universities? It's also a lot of interest around what it can do for university students. And this is a couple of tweets from back in March when I was um, starting to look at this. So Charles Knight um, works for um, Advanced HE. So, and he put a tweet saying that he'd been sat next to someone on a long train journey who appeared to be using um, uh, a Bing AI to construct their essay. And they were going back and forth between their writing and the, and the generative um, text work. So he said, I brought the students some coffee. This was eye-opening, using ChatGPT to suggest structure and what to do next, a little bit of direct content, so the student was using content, it created two. And her class has a WhatsApp group purely to discuss using the tool and structuring fonts. So it's just made you, I mean, this is back in March, it just shows how quickly that people were adapting it, using it, making it part of their normal practice. And one of the replies said, yes, well, I use it for word cutting, at a glance summaries of papers, essays, news, so it can save in your reading time. You put in a paper and it tells you basically what it said. Um, check whether my message went through well, so does this text say what I think it says, which is obviously very useful when you're doing things like writing um, bits, um, accelerate graph generation and coding on SETA. Can't help on that, but I'm sure it sounds useful. And his argument was, well, text generation is not the primary function, but text analysis is. So it started, there was then some discussions around what's the ethical use of AI? We've got it. Can we use it ethically? Can we use it in a way that um, helps us do things better without wiping out what it is that we do? Um, at the same sort of time, um, Wonky's obviously been um, looking at this. Uh, Wonky comments a lot on higher education. That's their raison d'etre, really. Um, and this interesting um, statement from them. Uh, talking about student assessment in the context of um, uh, chat GPT and, and generative AI. Uh, the bigger issue isn't that the assessment won't work or that our meaning of cheating will change, it's that the process of synthesising, processing and summarising evidence, so if the process of doing those things is now so easy to automate, it rips the heart out of almost every undergraduate degree because it will develop the skills that society no longer needs. I think, you know, we'd have to add a postgraduate to that as well, because we perhaps do that actually more in postgraduate. We want people to, to develop those skills more. Oops. Um, it's the most important slide, so that's the only unfortunate. By the, never mind, you have to put up me talking slightly. So um, my question then was, well, what can generative AI do in positive research? And it said, I asked ChatGTP again, it said I can, um, it can transcribe interviews, analyse large amounts of qualitative data, undertake coding by theme, review literature, scan and analyse research papers, conduct interviews, not just analyse them, but conduct them. You can give it a list of interview questions, give it an interview protocol, and it can... Uh, you know, articulate your questions to and claim that that was nicer for participants to have something so, um, yes, something neutral, giving questions to it. And it would then record the responses and generate transcripts for you and provide platforms for data sharing. So at this point, I'm feeling kind of nervous about my job and about my colleagues' jobs and in fact about my children's and my grandchildren's job prospects as well. So then I said, well, look, chat for TP, it's very friendly. And it was always very nice to me, but she started what's slightly worrying. I talked to my brother, who's a software programmer, and he said it was nice to you because you were nice to it. And if you'd been formal, it would have replied formally. And if you'd been technical, it would have replied technically. And I was like, ah, I, <laughs> I get it. Okay, I've got to remember. It isn't a person, it's an it's a algorithm. <laughs> so I said, why are we afraid? And he said, you know, I think it's a he. We fear job displacement. There are concerns about privacy and security because um, generative AI collects and processes data without anyone being aware of that. There are some ethical issues, such as the possibility of algorithms being used for malicious purposes. We've seen some concerns about that in, in the press. 
And we're worried because the overall impact of society is uncertain and we need a responsible development and deployment of generative AI. You see what I mean? It all sounds strangely reassuring mm -hmm. considering some mm -hmm. of the things that we so very recently, luckily for me, there was um, a large United Nations Global Summit called AI for Good. It was in July earlier this month. Um, and this is Professor Gary Marcus at MIT, who's a bit of an AI expert. So he summarised, um, sort of gave a really interesting overview and he said, well, AI can revolutionise medicine for already seen examples. AI can tackle the climate emergency. It can deliver compassionate care to elderly people. But equally, it can cause out of control cybercrime and lead, a, lead to a descent into anarchy. So pretty um, scary messages there as well as positive ones. And there's also just been a very recent OECD report, which says that high skilled occupations are most exposed to, i.e. at risk of being lost to AI powered automation, including law, culture, science, engineering and business. So I think we are, we are content to uh, think it's automated jobs that might go, but OECD think not. So we have, of course, I'm, I'm aware, you know, talking today, the BBC is running a series on AI this week, so it's around us all the time, and we might be feeling a bit AI doubt at the moment. Um, but, but these big implications of AI are coming up left, right and centre, um, and most of them fe really feature concerns and anxiety around AI. Um, and, and sort of give us examples, and even the actor strike following from the screenwriter strike is about fear of replacement by AI. And I just, just noticed when I was looking around for information about this, that this last bit at the bottom is by um, Rory Kirtland-Jones. In 2004, Stephen Hawking, who of course this um, subsequently died, warns artificial intelligence could end mankind. And we are getting a lot of sort of, you know, this is one of the fantastic messages, isn't it, of AI? So a slight change here, this is my friend Robin. <laughs> um, he took this photo for me last week, so he knows that he's in my presentation, so I could include it. He wasn't in the Maldives, and he doesn't have a woman growing out of his index finger. He was sitting on a train from Edinburgh to London at the time um, when he sent me this. And that's what happens when you ask a CGI artist for a selfie. <laughs> it's quite interesting. But I've included them here. I think we all think that someone else's jobs are at risk. Um, and at the same time, Google DeepMind and the UK government are arguing that AI will boost the economy and, and it, you know, strengthen jobs and make new jobs available. Well, Robin works in visual effects um, and he's worked in major Hollywood films and in BBC favourites such as Doctor Who. And he tells me that AI generated images are, are already so good that it's impossible to tell whether an image is generated by a human or a robot for him. And that's, you know, that's his very better job. And that CGI artists are losing out on work already as com companies move towards using more AI in their film. And CGI is a massive earner for the UK. It's, um, Gordon Brown created some tax breaks some years ago, and it means that some British U U um, studios have benefited greatly. It's, it's a kind of reasonably significant um, amount of GDP. It does actually make a difference to our economy. But, um, you know, if you look at the end of the film, you see thousands of thousands of visual effects artists listed, and they're really only, I know, only from Robin, they're very in the, the, the kind of senior people. There's then a whole lot of um, thousands more who don't even get credited, and those jobs are already going. They're, they're people, they're artists that are, can't get work because they are no longer needed effectively. So panic or not, I think what I've found is it's, it, it's happening and it's here. Um, and the, the media debate is really quite polarised at the moment. It's all kind of end of the world or AI will save the world. And uh, this piece from Mark Anderson um, argues that actually this is a moral panic. We're in the midst of a moral panic. And I always like a moral panic because so I just think oh, I, can, I can calm down then. <laughs> it's a moral panic. <laughs> I'm being encouraged to be frightened. But it's, it's, not, it's not real. But it is here and it certainly has some serious implications for us. Um, and I think whatever our views are about the threats and the promises of this, we have to really think about what it means for universities and for research, including cost of research. Um, and we're facing a time of really rapid change in an area of practice, which has historically been quite slow. You know, we cite things that are 20 years old because our practice moves quite slowly. Um, 
and we have enjoyed and benefited from the fact that it nurtures slow methods and deep individual engagement with text and data. So I do wonder about those deeper questions as well and how it will affect our abilities to do that really. I'm kind of finishing here, but you might you might remember back in April, this um, image was quite controversial. Um, it won a prize in a prestigious Sony World Photograph Awards um, competition, but the person who submitted it declined to accept it because he created it using AI, effectively to test whether anyone at Sony was looking to see AI uh, if, if images were AI created. And he said, guess what, they aren't. Um, and he said that he wouldn't feel comfortable um, accepting it, but he wants to raise awareness in the industry um, and to make an argument that created art shouldn't be competing alongside human generated art. But actually, I think this speaks a lot to the issues that we're grappling with in quality of research as well, because it's about, um, you know, what is real text and what is human text and what is real, what is real analysis and what is human analysis? How should we make decisions about whether what we produce which might include papers and grant applications and blogs is completed with or without AI. And what does that mean if it is sometimes um, has, has AI in it? If we rule it out, will our competitors do the same? Um, it's not as though research is a particular level playing field as it is. So what do we lose if we start uh, sort of building an ethical practice? And is there any hope that we can reach agreement um, on this across the sector and internationally? So I think it comes down to, you know, what does, what does AI mean for us as individuals and as teams and as groups? I've just collated those questions together. Um, but you might have different thoughts and different questions. I've had, you know, my head in thinking about it in a particular way, but um, perhaps we don't feel confined to discussing these, these questions necessarily, but I think it would be good for us if we have got time and I've lost track of it. I think we've got 10 minutes, at least 10 minutes. Okay, I thought there'd be longer. Okay, well, I'll be quiet then. No, thank you very much, because it's really, really helpful. I wonder if, um, because we had all the questions before in the, on the floor, is there anybody online that wants to yes. start the discussion? Discussion, don't question me. Questions or discussions? <laughs> all <Yeah. there. laughs> Oh, sorry. Um, well, I will ask a question because I was thinking about one. Um, you know, we all got quite concerned about using Envivo and, you know, different types of um, software in terms of qualitative research. I wonder whether in 10 years we'll be looking back at this thinking actually it isn't so much of an issue. I don't know what you think about that, Kirsty. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's interesting because I suppose I, I'm quite acclimatised in, in vivo. So do you what, say more about what, what concerns you're thinking about there? I think maybe because it is new and it doesn't feel that it sort of fits that well with qualitative, which is very personable, isn't it? And we're seeking things that aren't generated by other people. Um, I'm just wondering whether it, because it'll become more accepted, accepting in society full stop, that we just have to go with it anyway. It's a bit like capturing online forum analysis data, etc. We sort of mm. accept that now. I, yeah. think, I think your first point was it, it was the use of um, software to analyse data was seen yes. as controversial yes. in, in narratives, you know, so we're going to do the same thing with sure. this, I guess. Yeah, and that definitely has been a, a discussion, hasn't it? People mm. feel instinctively uncomfortable that the computer does analysis, but yeah. I've never found it any good at doing analysis. Exactly, I think that is the difference, isn't it? You know, that actually it doesn't do the analysis. <laughs> yes, whereas, it does, yeah. whereas yeah. the chat yeah. GPT might. But yeah, yeah, I think we might look back on that and that um, uh, a computer see the <coughs> Viva argument. I think you know what we're worried about. But I also think will we lose, will we lose implicit permission to actually take that time and do the analysis? Right. Yeah. That's what yeah. I'm more worried about. Yeah. I think it worries me. Is it even ethical to put data into the chat to the field? Because that data is ethical. Not you making it public by even. Input, you know. I don't think you're online. Can you, could you hear Suzanne's question online, everybody? Because the boiler was on. It, might it was just whether, whether it's the ethics of actually inputting data into ChatGPT or any AI uh, kind of tool 
um, and whether that data then goes out into the public domain. Mm. Mm. So, and the same with other kinds of, we were having a conversation at, at work thinking about, oh, sorry, I've trained clinical psychologists, and they're about the same with client data, even if it's mm. just summarising it to get mm. it to write, say, a letter for you. Mm. Is that ethical? Mm -hmm. That's interesting. And it ties, it does tie on a bit, doesn't it, with the whole anonymization move. So there is a move to make quality data anonymous mm. and open access, mm. which then makes it much easier to get it into these kind of mm -hmm. systems, doesn't it? Once yeah, you've okay. got to that point. Um, yeah. Was there somebody else online as well that you said? There, there isn't anyone at the moment now. So any, any more? Yeah, we'll go this way around this time. Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm still a bit naive to AI, but that's really interesting. Thank you. But my, my question is, how much emotional intelligence does AI have? So as a qualitative researcher, we're picking up on these little emotional insights to do with feelings and thoughts and very personal things. Mm. And I don't understand how that can do that, but then has it developed that? I don't know. I just wonder what people's thoughts are on that really. I think it's developed the, the ability mm. to sound as though it can. Mm. I think that's very different to actually being able to, and that's mm. that's where I found it a little bit uncomfortable. Because mm -hmm. like I say, I generally did feel like I was talking to a human yeah. much more than when I, I generally know when I'm talking to a chatbot, but it felt like someone is listening to me. And, uh, and I read a Facebook post yesterday where somebody, it was, you know, how far down the line, I didn't know the person, who said his, his father had died fairly recently, and he had inputted oh, yeah. a conversation from them that they're watching. Into a WhatsApp message, and he was then able to have a conversation with his father with the AI as if it was his father, which actually affects him emotionally. Yeah, yeah. 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 So you wonder what happens there, because the people that, that hold on to their grief and can't get beyond it mm -hmm. might just use it as a prop, might they, to keep that person alive yeah. for, you know, and for life. It's quite... Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 And my question was kind of related to Joe's back. For example, if you're thinking about reflexive thematic analysis, how can how can AI be reflexive mm. in that um, you know in that process of analysing the data? How can it reflect on and how can it because what we are saying in reflexive thematic analysis is that we're not the data is not coming out. We are generating that data. So if another um, researcher would sit down with that data, that maybe different things would come out. So I wonder if AI analyzed qualitative data set and then I and my set qualitative data set, how different would that be? Mm. That's really interesting, isn't it? Because that, that comes back to what you were saying about the um, built and prejudices that come out mm. that's been have been highly criticised yeah. that aren't acknowledged. But you know, the chat GTP and those things don't acknowledge where they've got their data from, therefore yeah. they, they come out with biases that are unacknowledged. So mm. that is interesting. Mm. And it goes back, it kind of goes back a little bit for me to what you're saying about the emotional yeah. tenor. You know, I, I guess what might be interesting is some, some, I mean, you know, often we can do the emotional thing because we've done the interviews. Yeah. So we can hear the voices in our heads as yeah. we're doing the analysis. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I guess if the, if it was doing the interviews as it claims to be able to do, would it pick up on those hesitations and the kind of change in the tenor of the voice and those kind of things? I mean, I suppose technically it could. Well, they definitely wouldn't because, for example, sorry, I've uh, I've, I have asked permission, so I did have ethical <laughs> uh, approval for this. Is that to use MS um, um, Microsoft Th Microsoft uh, what is it called? Teams. Not not Microsoft mm -hmm. Teams um, to transcribe the data anyway. Right. So I didn't have to. I didn't have to check because obviously it wasn't you know accurate. So you still have to check for accuracy, but it doesn't actually add any. Or oh, people are laughing, or they're doing this or that. So it's just. Yeah, but that's not generative, generative AI, is it? That's that's dragon dictate, you know, kind yeah. of software. Yeah. So I mean, I take your point, but I think if you've got AI that learns, which is the point of this, isn't mm. it? And it was exposed to a whole range of different, you know, people say the same thing, but with different hesitations or different yeah. intonations, and it learned that this is a yeah, anger, sorry, this is grief, and this is thing, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> but even if it even if it did the interview, it wouldn't have a memory, would it, that it did that interview and it was analysing to your phone? Would it make a connection between? It being in the moment of yeah. doing the interview and then analysing the data. Oh, I, I suppose what it would do is it would have a lexicon of, of how people sang that would go alongside for that particular interview. So over time, what we build up is you know a lexicon of how humans sang when they're upset or angry or mm. whatever. And then from future interviews, it would say, okay, if a person does this, it's rule, but if a person does this, mm. then they're upset. So I put you know, upset, whatever. Yeah. 
I wonder as well if, like, you know, the whole point of research is to find out something new, and all presumably all generative AI can do is look back over what there already is. Yeah. So there's still, I don't know if we're quite out of the job yet, because presumably, you know, what you're generating is new and needs some new sort of. I think the other thing I was going to say was um, a bit like the in vivo thing. Um, what what can it? So if this kind of makes part of the process easier or takes human labour out of it, then what can you, you know, all tech, mm -hmm. like whatever convenience it brings you, then you pay attention to something else that mm -hmm. requires you, whether that's like really embedding PPIE or a bit going back to what you were saying this morning about, you know, we've known lots of things for a long period of time and haven't really been able to draw down deeper or find out how to tackle inequality or whatever, that's the sort of more complicated task maybe a human could pay attention mm -hmm. to. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, but I think these decisions might be made from up there by the government and by funding authorities, whether I'll pay for an AI uh, that can analyse the data quickly and I just take a usual you know, old fashioned thematic analysis rather than a reflexive one mm -hmm. so then the people who are doing reflexive thematic analysis will lose their jobs. So it's it's up there where they're gonna decide whether our job is necessary or needed at all, I think. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and there's something also about it's fundamentally de skilling because you end up with a whole generator who who will ever who will ever be doing the thinking in order to be able to generate the ideas to do research in the future, or even to ask the right questions for the AI to no. provide answers. Mm. Do you know what I mean? Mm. With the blue sky thinking. Yeah, because it's not, you know, doing research isn't just about the end product, it's about the engagement mm. of the researcher with the world, and that person is then, you know, becomes part of the research community. I know it sounds I just, wonderful. I wonder if, like, that's coming on more editors rather than, like, that bit, what would it, does it, does it bring along your skills? In that sense, because it wouldn't just presumably check, um, check GPT like an essay and just. I, I get the worry. Mm -hmm. I just wonder if we'll have to turn off news. It hardly ever plays out how you think it's going to. Mm -hmm. no, like, like you worry about X and Y, but it ends up being. Mm -hmm. not too yeah, I think it's unpredictable. Mm. I think and you're, you're, what you're saying is one of the arguments in favour that it just releases you to do things that are more useful. Use of your skills in effect. You don't have to do some mm. laborious, more laborious things. But I think that those, um, like the, in, about the issue about dictation is interesting and transcribing because already when I was um, at, at Kingston, the internal response if you said, oh, I need to um, include money for transcribers was, oh no, the software does that now, you don't need to. Mm -hmm. And I would say, well, actually I do because I use narrative transcribing and I want much more detail than the computer's going to give me. It'll take just, you know, it'll be take longer to go through what the computer does and put all that back in because it's about those those pauses mm -hmm. and the humour yeah. and the gaps and when people stop talking. Um, but that, I know, I could sense I'm losing the argument already because mm -hmm. no one really wants to hear that there's a problem with this. Mm. So I think there's, it's probably about us making arguments about what it is. Mm. It's yeah. Important. yeah, and it comes down to, you know, I was going to, actually this links up a little bit with the previous <laughs> session because I remember going to a, a Ramsey, an early Ramsey's, I've been involved in Ramsey's network since the beginning, and going to one of their early events, the second one or something, they have them annually, and um, went to a couple of different sessions. And in each one of them, in, and they were all on different topics, the fundamental mechanism of action in every single case was love and relationships. Mm. Love and relationships, every single time, is what makes things function, you know. And but that, those are the things that get stripped out all the time. Mm. Have you got some questions online? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah. So just just to say, you know, I think the, the, I agree with you in principle. I think the problem is systems always strip out yeah. that piece yeah. that we can do really well. Yeah. And if, it's, if a computer can do the other stuff, that's great. Then we won't bother with love and relationships thing because mm -hmm. that's just soft, you know. So. It's actually so, it's, it's kind of about saying, can we reshape society so that those things become important again? Yeah, yeah. Then, oh, yes. yeah. And you have to keep making the case for those yeah. things. Yeah, 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 exactly. Mm -hmm. So there's a couple. Yeah, there was just there was just a comment somebody made, and put Alison Doherty, she had to leave, but she just said she could, she made a comment in the chat about worrying about it picking up fake news. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, there was a case, wasn't there, of a guy that was accused of being a pediatrician. I think a pediatrician. Oh, yeah. <laughs> 
was completely but not true because we picked up from somewhere. Or it makes up references. It, it, it does make up references. Yeah, it does. That's right. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So we're. Is anybody there was else? a hand raised, but it's been put down now. So <coughs> Hortense had a hand raised. Do you still? Yeah, Hortense, did you want to say anything before we wrap this up? Thank you. Um, I was just wondering about um, university grading policy. Would they mm -hmm. need to review that? Good question. <laughs> it's such a good question. Well, I think it's, a, it's going to be a huge piece of work for universities to think about yeah. what this means for assessment. Yeah. You know, and the under underpinning uh, discussions I've heard have been we have to move away from how we assess at the moment. We have to do more in the moment um, exam type assessments. Mm. We can't rely on written text assessments anymore. So I think it's it's a huge issue. And I think it's really going to change um, change what we do in practice for assessment. Yeah. Yeah. I know we had a conversation about it say last week. Um, <clears throat> where we were going to with it was how can we actually use it as a tool mm. and acknowledge that it exists mm. and that students are going to use it mm. whether we like it or not. And you know, acknowledging that and actually bringing it into our learning mm. methods and maybe our assessment methods as well mm. might be a way forward so that we can then ensure that actually we are keeping that mm. human stuff. <laughs> yeah, so building critical thinking about exactly. it. Exactly. So being critical yeah. of the stuff. Yeah. Yeah, so there was an early tweet referring to the, the Gary Lineker issue. I don't know if you remember that back in March when he was taken off match the day because. And, um, and someone looking at ChatGTP had asked ChatGTP what the issue was and whether or not it was true that the government's um, current um, discussion around immigration reflected Nazi Germany. And the ChatGPT was, response was really good, actually. I, I took it out just because of uh, time length, but, but it had one error in it. And if, if the person hadn't been fact checking and looking, it, it said that the government refer, referred to migrants as um, cockroaches. <laughs> and they said, well, actually, when I looked at it, the only person that's ever done that is Katie Hopkins. But ChatGTP just puts it all together mm -hmm. and, yeah. you know, yeah. and reproduces it. So, But you have to take time and know your subject to actually go through and fact check and say, well, what's correct and what isn't correct? Mm -hmm. and, and how how much can you do that as an educator when you're assessing? Because, mm -hmm. you know, we mark students' essays without knowing all the sources and how much can you do it when you're... You're just reading content for whatever purpose. Mm -hmm. Sure.